So yeah, my lab studies this phenomenon called clonal hematopoiesis, which I think some of you have heard about and, and it was talked about a little bit yesterday. Um, these are my disclosures. So, so clonal hematopoiesis fits very nicely into the paradigm of the multi-hit pathogenesis of cancer, um, probably first described in the colorectal system by um, um, Weinberg and colleagues. Um, and so when we're young, we have very few mutations in our cells, uh, but these mutations accumulate linearly throughout time, throughout life. Most of these mutations are harmless. They don't have a fitness consequence upon the cell. Um, but rarely a mutation will arise that allows the cell to clonally expand, outcompete its other cells, the wild-type cells. And when this occurs in a hematopoietic stem cell, we call this clonal hematopoiesis. Um, and if additional cooperating mutations are acquired later in life, then cancers may result. Uh, and this largely explains why cancer is a disease of aging. It takes time for these cycles of mutation, selection, expansion, mutation, selection, expansion to occur. Um, and this phenomenon is not you know, unique. We, we didn't discover this. This has been postulated by many groups to occur in many tissues. Uh, and also just highlight this very nice uh, review article that uh, Katrina and Irv uh, recently wrote in the New England Journal that describes this phenomenon. Now, would we expect this process of clonal hematopoiesis to be common or rare with aging? So let's just do a quick back of the envelope calculation. Uh, we know that there are roughly 100,000 hematopoietic stem cells in each of us, a range of about 50,000 to 200,000 hematopoietic stem cells in an adult human. We also know that each HSC acquires about one protein coding mutation every 10 years, which doesn't sound like a big number. But if you multiply these two numbers together, you can calculate that by the age of 70, there will be 1.4 million protein coding mutations in the stem cell pool in each of us, an average of about 70, pro 70 protein coding mutations per gene. If just one of these is sufficient to give rise to this kind of clonal expansion, we would expect this to be common with aging. Um, and indeed it is. So this is a, a graph shown from a paper that we published now almost a decade ago. This is a graph of the, the frequency or the prevalence of these mutant clones as a function of age. And you can see that under the age of 40, these are relatively rare, but increase with prevalence with each decade of life, such that when you look at people who are 70 or older, between 10 to 30% will have a detectable clone circulating in their blood with a cancer-associated mutation. Now, based on these studies, I mean, my co-authors proposed a novel clinical entity that we termed clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, or CHIP for short. It's defined as the presence of one of these cancer-associated clonal mutations with a variant allele fraction of greater than 2% in the blood of healthy people, people who do not have any other known hematologic disorder. Um, as I've told you, it's common with aging. Um, but CHIP is also associated with all kinds of other things. Um, so in our initial studies, we found that there was a 30% increased risk of mortality. Um, there's a tenfold increased risk of developing blood cancers, especially myeloid cancers like AML and MDS. And surprisingly, um, we reported that CHIP was associated with a twofold increased risk of developing coronary heart disease in, in large population cohorts. Recent investigators have also found that CHIP is associated with the risk of heart failure, chronic liver disease, gout, uh, COPD, osteoporosis, diabetes, thrombosis. The list actually just keeps going on and on and on. The common denominator in probably all of these conditions, in addition to being diseases of aging, um, they're all chronic inflammatory diseases or diseases where the immune system is thought to play a major role. And we believe, based on, on multiple studies that I'm not going to go into today, that a lot of the mutations that are found in CHIP uh, may increase the innate immune system's capacity for inflammatory gene expression. Um, and then one other recent finding that we've had, um, so CHIP is associated with all these kinds of bad things, we recently found that actually there's one good thing, CHIP seems to be associated with a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease um, for reasons we don't fully understand right now, but this, was, uh, this work was just published earlier this year. So what I really wanna talk about is why do these mutations occur? Why do they exist? Why are they selected for? 
So if you think back to the cancer biology classes that you may have taken in college, you learned about things like oncogenes and tumor suppressors. Oncogenes are typically activating mutations and signaling pathways, so think of MYC and RAS. Tumor suppressors are typically uh, inactivated, and they're involved in cell cycle checkpoints, so think of things like retinoblastoma and TP53. So we do see those. We see classical oncogenes in CHIP, but they're a distinct minority. Only about 10% of the total mutations uh, will fall neatly into one of these two categories. Instead, the great majority of the mutations occur in genes involved in gene expression regulation, so things like DNMT3A and TET2, which are both methylation-modifying enzymes, DNA methylation-modifying enzymes, ASXL1, which is a chromatin factor, and then genes involved in the spliceosome. So these are the most common mutations in clonal hematopoiesis. So why is that? We thought that one of the reasons it's been really hard to figure out why these mutations occur, what are the factors that promote the expansion of these clones, it's not so easy to study this directly in humans. So if you think about um, kind of an ideal study design, you would have hundreds of thousands of people that you have followed for 30 or 40 years, and you'd have serial blood sampling on all of them, maybe every three or four years. And then you track the growth of these individual clones, and then perform association tests to see what factors correlate with what different clones. Unfortunately, these kinds of uh, longitudinal blood sampling cohorts do not exist. And so this was really the motivation for our study that I'm going to tell you about today. So we want to know what are the factors that influence the rate of clonal expansion uh, in humans. And so we wondered, could we invent a method to estimate how these clones are growing, how quickly they're growing from just a single time point? And so let's do a, a little thought experiment. So remember I told you that these mutations occur in all, all of your cells, most of them are harmless. We call those passenger mutations. And these passenger mutations have a clock-like property. They occur at a linear rate with respect to time. And for hematopoietic stem cells, that rate is 17 single nucleotide variants per year per hematopoietic stem cell. So let's imagine you have two people with CHIP. They have a clone of the same size, and they're currently the same age. And let's say you could sequence the cell of origin for that clone, and you identify that in person one's clone, the cell of origin has 680 passengers. Person two's clone has 340 passengers. So what we can infer is that person two was likely age 20 when that mutant clone was born. Person one was likely age 40. But because they now have clones of the same size, person one's clone must have grown twice as fast. So that is the logic that we're going to try to capture with our statistical method that we developed that we call the Passenger Approximated Clonal Expansion Rate, or PACER for short. To implement this method, we use data from the TopMed study. This is an NHLBI-funded initiative that performed whole genome sequencing on greater than 100,000 people using peripheral blood DNA. And from this data, we want to obtain three valuable pieces of information. First, the age of the person at the time of DNA sampling, the size of the mutant clone given by the variant allele fraction, as well as the passenger count in their chip clone, which we can infer from the whole genome sequencing data. And we did this for about 5,000 people with, uh, with chip, so a, a pretty decent sized study. We then put these pieces of information to a simple statistical model, a linear regression model, where the outcome variable is the passenger count, which we think is a surrogate, as I've mentioned, for the clone birth date. And then the explanatory variables are age, which is a surrogate for how much time has passed, how, much, how long has that clone been growing, um, as well as the variant allele fraction, which is a measure of the clone size. And then if you plot the number of passengers versus the input variables, you get a, a graph that looks somewhat like this. You can draw a line of best fit. And what we're interested in is the residual. So that is the deviance on the y-axis, the count of the passengers from the line of best fit for each individual. And we hypothesize that this residual would be an individual level measure of clone fitness. So if it's strongly positive, that's a fast growing clone. If it's strongly negative, it's a slow growing clone. 
So we validated this approach in several ways, um, but I'll tell you about the most important. Um, so a very important benchmark in clonal hematopoiesis is how quickly clones with different driver mutations grow over time. So not all mutations are created equal. And the gold mark uh, or benchmark data set that we uh, used was from George Basilio's lab uh, at Cambridge. This was published last year. Uh, and they did empirical longitudinal sequencing of clonal hematopoiesis in about 400 people. Um, and what they found was that the fastest growing clones were those that had driver mutations in the splicing factors U2AF1, SRSF2, SF3B1, as well as JAK2 mutations. And in our PACER model, these are also the fastest growing clones. Um, in the middle are genes like TET2 and ASX01, and similarly in our PACER model, these were in the middle. And among the slowest growing clones were those that harbored DNMT3A mutations um, that was observed in the Basilio data and replicated in our PACER model. So when we compare our results from this gold standard empirical data set, the correlation of clone fitness based on driver gene is quite good, an R squared of 0.8. So we're fairly confident that this works. And so now, armed with this method, we wanted to know, could we do an unbiased survey of inherited genetic variation, perform a genome-wide association study to tell us which genes and pathways causally associate with a clonal fitness advantage? And this is the result of that GWAS. So you can see that there is a single locus that reaches genome-wide significance. The lead variant at this locus is called RS2887399. It's a single nucleotide polymorphism in the promoter of a gene called TCL1A. The reference allele at this locus is a guanine, and the alternate allele is a thymine, a T. And the alternate allele is associated with slower clone growth. So if you have this T allele, your clones just don't grow as quickly. There's a bit that's known about TCL1A. Um, it hasn't been implicated before in hematological cancers, but only in this very rare type of cancer called T-prolymphocytic leukemia, where it occurs as a translocation with a TCR alpha locus, thought to aberrantly drive TCL1A expression in mature T cells to cause this malignancy. There's also something known about the biology of this gene. It's thought to form a dimer with itself and it's also thought to bind to AKT and potentially activate it via an unknown mechanism. And we'll come back to this at the end of the talk. However, prior to our studies, there was no known role for this gene in myeloid malignancy or HSC biology. So the first thing we wanted to know is whether this particular variant, RS2887399, associated with the rate of growth of all chip clones or only a subset of drivers. And so using our PACER analysis in TopMed, we compared DNMT3A clones to TET2 mutant clones. And surprisingly, what we found was actually there was no association with DNMT3A clone growth. So the, the PACER estimate, which is the, the clone growth estimate, is pretty flat regardless of your genotype. In contrast, for people with TET2 mutations, having a T allele resulted in slower clone growth and two T alleles, even slower clone growth. We were able to replicate this using actual longitudinal data. So we took data from the Women's Health Initiative where we identified 400 people with clonal hematopoiesis who had two blood samples taken 16 years apart. And so we could do the same kind of analysis, measure the uh, growth rate per year and associate it to driver gene and the SNP. And again, we observed no effect for DNMT3A mutant clones, but for clones that had ASXL1 mutations, SF3B1 mutations, or TET2 mutations, there was an apparent association with the SNP. Slower growth. This was also reflected in the prevalence of these mutations uh, based on the presence of this allele. Um, so what I'm showing you here is that if you have two alt alleles, or the TT genotype of, at the SNP, you have about a 40% reduction in tattoo mutations, a 70 to 80% reduction in splicing factor mutations, about a 50 to 60% reduction in ASXL1 mutations. So actually quite large effect sizes uh, for just this one germline polymorphism. 
And so next we wanted to know how does this work? So what is this SNP doing? What is this gene doing? How does this explain clonal expansion? And so the first thing you always do when you get uh, one of these results in a GWAS is you try to figure out where that gene is expressed. And we looked in existing data sets, like single cell RNA-seq data sets that are publicly available from healthy people, and TCL1A is not expressed in normal HSCs. It's just not expressed at all. And so this was very perplexing to us. How could this gene seemingly be so important for clonal expansion, but not be on in HSCs? Well, the aha moment was when we actually examined some data from Ravi Majetti and Howard Chang's group, this uh, Corsis et al. paper, in which they performed attack sequencing from purified pre-leukemic HSCs. So these were people who had AML but had residual pre-leukemic HSCs that only harbored the initiating driver mutation. And when we looked in people who had normal HSCs or pre-leukemic -leu pre HSCs without a known driver, we didn't see any activity at this locus. So this is a taxi, so we're looking for open chromatin at the TCL1A promoter. We didn't see anything. And similarly, when people had DNMT3A mutations in their HSCs, we didn't see anything. However, in the two people who had TET2 mutant pre-leukemic HSCs, there was accessible chromatin at the promoter, suggesting to us that maybe this is a gene that's not normally on in HSCs, but if you acquire the right mutation, it gets aberrantly expressed. So it goes from off to on. To test this more directly, we used um, CRISPR. So we identified donors who had the three genotypes we uh, edited them to have TET2 mutations, DNMT3A mutations, or asx one mutations. We cultured the cells for a bit and then measured TCL1A protein level using flow cytometry. And what we found was that indeed in the wild type edited cells, control edited cells, or the DNMT3A edited cells, no TCL1A expression. But we did find um, some cells that expressed TCL1A when asx one or TET2 were edited if the donor had the GG genotype. But with each increasing T allele, the proportion of cells that were able to express TCL1A decreased. So this suggested to us that the reason that this T allele is protective, why it slows clonal expansion, is because it reduces TCL1A expression in the setting of these mutations. So that's kind of a, like a loss of function experiment using uh, inherited human genetic variation. Can we test this directly? So to do that, we used an shRNA that we showed knocked down TCL1A protein about 90% at the protein level, and then did an in vitro clonal expansion assay. So we took HSCs, we edited them either with a control guide or a TET2 guide, and then infected them with lentivirus that either contained scramble shRNA or the TCL1A shRNA. And so what we observed is that when TET2 is mutated, but the scramble guide is given, we see robust increase in the number of HSCs in vitro, but this was largely abrogated when TCL1A was knocked down. So this shows the necessity of TCL1A for the expansion phenotype. What about sufficiency? So we did the analogous sufficiency experiments by overexpressing TCL1A using a lentiviral vector in human HSCs, and uh, we did our 14-day clonal expansion assay, and again, we observed increased expansion of HSCs just by expressing TCL1A in these HSCs. This was reflected both in the HSC count at the end of the experiment as well as the number of colony forming units. And finally, we did this um, in vivo as well. We did a mouse competitive transplant experiment where progenitor uh, bone marrow cells were transduced with either the control virus or the TCL1A expressing virus, competed against wild type bone marrow, and then we followed the mice over time. You can see that the proportion of GFP positive donor granulocytes increases in the mice that got cells transduced with TCL1A, but not in the mice that got the control cells, showing in vivo clonal expansion as well. So the last part of my talk, I just want to discuss a little bit about the mechanism, and um, I'll admit that this is still a work in progress. So I told you that TCL1A forms a dimer with itself and it also binds to AKT, potentially activating AKT via a number of downstream mechanisms. And so we wondered if TCL1A is expressed, do the cells proliferate more? 
Um, and we, indeed they do. So when we look for the proportion of cycling cells, we see about a doubling in the number of cells that are in cycle when TCNA is expressed. To better understand the mechanism, we did a, a SiteSeq experiment. So we took HSCs from two different donors, transduced them with either controlled uh, lentivirus or TCNA overexpressing lentivirus, cultured them for some days, um, used antibodies, uh, stain the cells with antibodies so we could identify them by cell sur surface marker phenotype, um, and then did single cell RNA sequencing. And what I'll draw your attention to is that we found that there were four clusters of HSCs slash MPPs um, based on the cell surface marker phenotype. That's how we define HSCs and MPPs. And we wanted to know is, is there, what are these different clusters and does TCNA alter the relative proportion of any of these clusters? And so the, what we're calling HSC MPP1 is probably kind of a classic proliferative HSC. It expresses a lot of uh, stem identity genes. Um, it's highly proliferative um, and doesn't really express stress response genes. But as you go down to two and three and four, what you observe is less cycling, more stress, um, including genes involved in the integrated stress response, as well as genes that are known to be targets of FOXO transcription factors, including genes that inhibit cell cycle like CDKN1A or genes involved in apoptosis. And when we looked to see what happened when TCNA is expressed, we saw that in the, the, the cultures where TCNA was expressed, there were more cells in HSC MPP1 and less cells, or fewer cells in HSC MPP3 and 4, suggesting that perhaps the reason that TCNA promotes clonal expansion is that they it keeps HSCs in this proliferative state. Is this dependent on AKT? Um, well, we do know that there are some mutants of TCNA that abrogate uh, AKT interaction, specifically this D16G mutant, as well as this 36, uh, 38 amino acid, uh, alanine conversion mutant. And when we did experiments for clonal expansion using these mutants, we did see that there was reduced clonal expansion compared to the wild-type version of the protein, suggesting that perhaps it is uh, uh, relevant to AKT. Um, this is not the whole story, though, because TCNA expression does not phenocopy what others have seen when you knock out the upstream components of AKT activation, such as loss of P10 or uh, loss of FOXO transcription factors. In, in those models, HSCs actually exhaust themselves. So there's something different that we don't quite understand about TCNA. And finally, I'll just say that this may also be relevant for heme malignancies um, when we look in the hematopoietic stem cells of patients who have CMML or MDS, we can see TCNA is expressed in these malignant HSCs. Um, this is at the RNA level. We've also shown this at the protein level. Um, so you can see that in these two high-risk MDS cases, the HSCs um, do robustly express TCNA, uh, but not the, the healthy bone marrow. And so I'll end my talk on, uh, on just a summary of what I just said and, and using a very cheesy analogy. So I, I played a lot of video games as a kid. Um, Nintendo version one was popular at the time and there was a famous cheat code that you could enter. And if you hit these buttons really fast, it would unlock a superpower for your character. And so I would analogize these mutations like TET2 and ASX1 as the cell entering that cheat code. And the superpower that is unlocked is the expression of TCNA. And once TCNA is expressed, these cells can now proliferate much more than they normally would. They're resilient to stress. They clonally expand. And that's what causes clonal hematopoiesis. And the reason that we were able to find this is that for some reason there exists in the human genome, this SNP RS2887399, that prevents this from happening. So this would be like as if somebody went into the code of the game and deleted the cheat code. So now you can push those buttons as many times as you want. It doesn't give the same effect. Um, and so uh, that's what we think is happening. And, and just to bring it back to what I told you earlier, I think we can now say that at least some of these genes fall into a category of being TCNA dependent and potentially explaining why they cause clonal expansion. 
um, and I'll just acknowledge the people that did this lab to uh, do the, did this work in my lab. Two very fantastic graduate students, uh, J.K. Gopu Kumar, Josh Weinstock. It was a very close collaboration with Alex Bick at Vanderbilt. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>